Yeah, so we were, um, we left off at this slide here where I was discussing what the conditions for feasibility and optimality of the basis are. Again, the important thing to remember about uh, simplex, and this will come up a lot in the, in the course, um, is to remember to try to express the objective function as a function of the non-basic uh, variables. So if you remember, I derived this closed form expression in the last end of last lecture for those parts of the objective function that depend on the non-basic variables. And basically what you have is this constant multiplying the non-basic variables. If no components of this are uh, greater than zero, we're done. There's no benefit to be gained by increasing a non-basic variable. We, we found an optimal basis. And the rationale is as simple as that. So the book uses the word dictionary, which will come up in chapter three, about discussing uh, basically the set of basic uh, variables. So how the simplex algorithm behaves really quick, and I'm assuming um, this has been covered in previous classes, but just a, a, real, a really quick uh, reminder. Um, we start from a feasible dictionary, which means a feasible basis, one that when you take its inverse and multiply by b, it's greater than or equal to zero. Um, and we find, uh, by computing this vector here, components that are positive. If we find one, we make it an entering variable, and we start pushing it up. We look at the first basic variable that is pushed to zero, and that is our leaving variable. And we have optimality of the simplex algorithm when we can't find any entering variables. So all the components of this vector are less than or equal to zero. And if I end up finding one component here that is positive, and there is no one that's leaving the basis, what can I conclude? You can send it as far as up as you want. So we have an unbounded problem. And there's a trick called phase one for recovering a feasible basis in case you can't uh, find one already. There's an example in the book. I'll go through it really quick. It's just a reminder of uh, the simplex algorithm. We have this linear program. The first annoying thing is it's not in uh, standard form. So we convert it to standard form by adding the slack variables. So subtract in the first equality, add in the second one. Um, if we pick the uh, auxiliary variables as, sorry, the, the slack variables as bases, then you see that S1 is infeasible. So even in, now, now that it's in standard form, we still don't have a feasible basis, so we need to introduce an auxiliary variable. The auxiliary variable is just going to be adding a var um, something positive here to make the left-hand side um, um, equal to, to, um, to uh, uh, 5. So, yeah, we add this artificial variable. Um, and we make it the objective function of the problem. The way phase one works is when we add the artificial variable over here, plus, one, plus A1, that now becomes a member of the basis, and that in S2. So uh, we write out the objective function, again, as a function of the non-basic variable. So here are the linear expressions for the basis as a function of the non-basic variables. And if we plug these into the objective function, this is the important thing to look at and see if we're done or not. If there are guys here that can come in and help the objective function, we pick one of them as the entering variable. In this case, it turns out to be, for example, x1. Why? Because for every unit of x1, we're getting more uh, benefit than for x2. And as x1 is increasing, a1 drops out. We do a basis swap. This is the new, uh, these are the new basic variables. So x1 comes in, a1 leaves. This is the objective function of the phase one as a function of the non-basic variables. 
and here we uh, find that there is no entering uh, basic variable ca that can improve the situation, so we're done with phase one. Um, we, once we're done with phase one, we can drop our auxiliary variable, and what we're left with is a feasible basis. And then we iterate the simplex algorithm as you're accustomed to it. But the important thing to note is that this, uh, always when you're looking at the simplex table, these, uh, this uh, expression here of the objective function as a function of non-basic variables is just this stuff times a constant. And that's what you always need to be paying attention to to see if you're um, finished or not. Okay, um, so that's the simplex algorithm. Uh, the dual um, problem, and we will see this in more detail in the coming lecture, is for the standard form uh, problem is given uh, by the following optimization problem here. And we know from weak duality that this uh, dual problem is an upper or lower problem. Upper because it's a relaxation, basically, yeah, we get it as a relaxation, a Lagrangian relaxation of the original problem. And what, um, uh, what, 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 a couple of important things we know are, first of all, um, there's the if and only if relationship that, um, a primal optimal solution is equivalent to the existence of a dual optimal solution. And we also have complementary slackness conditions which can be uh, useful computationally. So complementary slackness conditions tell you, you tell me what your dual optimal variables are, I can use the complementary slackness conditions to recover the primal optimal solution. And the other way around, you tell me what your primal optimal solution are, I, uh, I can use the complementary slackness conditions to get the dual optimal solution. Um, now, the, the, the book then uses a couple of uh, definitions for uh, nonlinear programming. Here, the only um, um, interesting thing to notice is that you can have a nonlinear optimization problem where you explicitly write out the constraints, or you can write, uh, write them through an indicator function. This function will be zero whenever you satisfy the constraints, and it will punish you if uh, severely if you violate them. Um, standard definitions for convexity, so given a set of points, um, x1 through xi, Convex combination is anything that can be obtained as a weighted sum of these uh, points. And uh, by weighted sum, where we mean a coefficients that uh, sum up to one and are non negative. And the definition of a convex set is a set that contains all of its uh, convex combinations. So obviously, a set like this is not convex just because. Uh, here are two points in the set, we can find one in, the, in between which is a convex combination and it doesn't land in the set. Uh, ex an extreme point is one that you cannot express as a convex combination of any two other points in the set. Um, and the convex hull of a group of uh, points is the set of points that you can express as convex combinations of this group. Geometrically, the important thing to remember is that when you're taking a sum of weights that um, over two points that um, equals to one, you're basically just shifting as uh, lambda is running from zero to one. You're shift, you're moving along this line over here. So, in the final combination of these two points, is a point that lands somewhere along this line. That's uh, geometric fact to remember. And the last definition from, I believe, yeah, okay. Yeah, then we get to 
stuff that we will cover next week. The last definition to remember is uh, definition of affine uh, constraints. An affine constraint is linear plus a constant. An affine space is the set of points that uh, satisfy an affine constraint, which geometrically is hyperplane. And the parallel subspace is referred to the hyperplane that goes through zero. Um, the dimension is uh, of, of the affine constraint is the dimension of the hyperplane. Okay, um, these we will cover in much more detail. Well, actually, I'll give you the definition of the convex function in case you don't know it. Um, just to, to refresh, so the geometric intuition is the following. You, the fu function is convex if you give me any two points and Here's where this uh, geometry here comes into play. The weighted average of f of x1 and f of x2 is greater than or equal to the function evaluated at the weighted average. So this is the definition of uh, convexity. We will use this definition a lot today for a bunch of the proofs that we will do. Okay. Um, the presentation we're going to go through today is basically chapter four of the book, and it addresses the question of when it's worth bothering to solve a stochastic program. And the intuitive answer of when is it worth bothering to solve a stochastic program is, well, if, um, how much would be the benefit that I get from bothering to solve a stochastic program relative to doing something much simpler? What is the simplest alternative you can think of to solving an optimization problem under uncertainty? Any thoughts? I mean, a fairly reasonable, but very simple alternative. I give you a bunch of scenarios. Yeah. Just for it, so the key the mean, cos cos. Yeah, that's very natural. You just take the average of the uncertainty and solve a deterministic equivalent problem. Well, if that's going to give you a benefit that's almost an objective, a performance that's going to be almost the same as the performance of the stochastic programming solution. It's not really worth bothering solving the stochastic program. And that's one measure of, um, that we will focus on today, and that's called the value of the stochastic solution. Another measure of uh, performance is what's the best situation you can be in when you're facing, uh, can you think of a lower Suppose we are um, uh, maximizing some objective. Uh, sorry, so we're, we're minimizing some co expected cost. Can you think of a lower bound to the uh, expected cost? A scenario. The most, uh, the easiest to deal with. Yeah, because if everything goes to our, to our advantage, then we cost less. Yeah. Some situations, however, have a, so in problems like meeting, satisfying demand, the best scenario is the lowest demand scenario. But there are more complex setups where it's not obvious. For example, let's suppose we're looking at a stock market, uh, a stock trading problem. One scenario has a price spike in the beginning of the day. Another scenario has a price spike at the end of the day. It's kind of not clear which one is. Both of them have a price spike, but it's not sure. It's not exactly clear which one is more favorable. Can you think of an alternative? What if you walk into a casino? What would you really like to be able to do when you're playing uh, blackjack? Ideally, or the roulette. 
How would you in every time? Come again? Knowing what was yeah. If you know what's gonna happen, if you know the next card, you can bet accordingly. So a perfect foresight is something you can write as a math program. And it will give you a lower bound if you're minimizing cost in terms of performance. So the difference of how you do on average, if you have to make a decision here and now versus waiting and seeing what happens and then deciding, is what's called the um, um, expected value of perfect information. And we will see these definitions formally now. So expected value of perfect information is the first paragraph, value of stochastic solution is the second. And again, the motivation of uh, all of uh, this analysis is You know, if there's a simple way I can come up with a decision rule, then maybe it's not even worth bothering a stochastic program. So definition of expected value of perfect information, being able to know what happens in advance. Um, we have a minimization setup, a two-stage optimization problem, which is a linear program in the second stage. Uh, the uncertainty in general can be over the cost coefficients, the right hand sides here, and the coefficients of the x variables, but we'll focus our attention in the next couple of slides only in the situation where the right hand sides here are uncertain. And you will see this notation coming up a lot in the book later, so K1 is the polyhedron defined by the first stage constraints, so these two qualities here. And K2 for a given uh, realization Xi is the polyhedron of, in the Y dimension that satisfies the second stage quality constraints for that realization Xi. So here Xi and um, yeah Xi influences H and T. Okay if we can't find any um, oh so the convention is that if we make a first stage choice that is either not compatible with first stage constraints or uh, not compatible with second stage constraints for a certain realization, then the Z, we, uh, the convention is that it becomes plus infinity. Uh, and then if we can also find a way to um, um, push our um, Costs to minus infinity, we cannot. It's it's possible to have an unbounded below uh, problem. So the the assumption in the uh, in, in the analysis is that we will always be able to find an x such that we can react in the second stage with a feasible second stage reaction. If we can't find such an x in the first stage, our problem is fundamentally uh, not well posed. If there are some outcomes of uncertainty that result in second stage infeasibility, then it's not a meaningful optimization problem to deal with. We will have to somehow reformulate our problem to, even if with high penalties we get away with it, we have to somehow have a second stage reaction that's feasible for anything that could happen in terms of uncertainty. Um, so we, we assume that there is always a first stage decision that is second stage feasible. Okay, the definition of being an oracle, being able to predict what will happen in the future is uh, the wait and see um, uh, solution. So what are we doing here? Does this notation here make sense? What comes first, action or information? Information. The expectation operator is first. And once we see the Xi, we act by minimizing X. This is impossible, right? We can only do this if we know what the Xi is going to be. But in real situations, we can't do this. So. We can solve for this, but it's not something we could do in real life. But the useful thing is it gives us a, a lower bound on costs. 
Um, in contrast, what we can do, the best we can do, is uh, to solve the recourse problem, the here and now solution. So I make a decision here and now, uh, I minimize x so that my average costs are as small as possible. And the expected value uh, of perfect information that I mentioned earlier is the difference of uh, these two. Okay, so note here the exchange of the expectation and minimization operator make a big difference. Okay, um, here's um, the um, a simple alternative to solving a stochastic program. We make a forecast xi bar about our uncertainty. We plug that into our uh, optimization problem and we solve this expected value problem. What do you think uh, computationally is how uh, how would you rank in terms of computational effort getting our hands on this number versus this number versus EV? What do you think is most difficult to deal with computationally? I think this one is the easiest. This one is the easiest? Just an LP for two. The first one yeah. is how many linear? The, the, uh, the first one here, the wait and see. Uh, yes. Here's the thing: if I have um, a thousand scenarios, how many linear programs do I need to solve? Uh, a thousand. Each one of these guys, though we're assuming is a, has a constraint matrix that is fairly, uh, sorry. So if these are the y variables, it's T1, T1, yeah. um, We solve a thousand of these guys. Now, the stochastic program, its structure, if we have a thousand, is take this and multiply it a thousand times. This is the first scenario, this is the second scenario, and so on. And this is the, the T matrix. So T, Y, this is the y's for the first scenario. These are the y's for the second scenario that get hit with this bluff, and so on. And then we have a wx plus t of this monster equals the right-hand side. Um, if you have a fast way of solving this, even if uh, we have many uh, scenarios, we can solve it really fast, even multiple times. However, here, the computational effort increases dramatically, especially um, in cases where you have um, like uh, integer first stage constraints, th this becomes a, an enormous branch and boundary. So generally the idea is you want to deal with small, as small modules of optimization problems as possible, even if you have to solve them many times, versus having enormous constraint sets. Because you pay the price for enormous constraint sets through an enormous number of iterations of a simplex algorithm or an enormous branching of the branching boundary. The idea, and this will be constant throughout the class, is to chop up optimization problems into smaller uh, pieces. More constraints hit, hurt you more than many optimiza small optimization problems. Is that, have you encountered this in like, a practical experience before? This, for example, I might not even be even able to load it in my computer. So it's hopeless to... Interestingly, in my experience at least, more often, for linear programs at least, it's, it's, the, the, the bottleneck is memory. You, call, you crash your computer with memory before you even crash it with running time. You can give it bigger and bigger problems as long as it loads into C clips it will solve, but after a certain point, the constraint matrix becomes so big that it can't even load into C. Yeah. 
uh, CPLEX. So that's the uh, that's why we're even bothering with WS is because we can actually compute it easier. Okay. Um, so then, okay. This is the expected value problem, um, and the once we solve it, we get a solution x bar of the average outcome, and then we can just uh, sum up the uh, weighted average costs of sum up the weighted costs of these uh, problems and come up with the expected performance or expected result of the EV solution, which we denote as E E V. You will see a lot of initials today, but I will have like a, a graph that kind of kind of puts them, ranks them in increasing order. So hopefully, although they're kind of confusing when you see them in the first time, eventually you'll um, get a feel for them. Okay, now we establish a bunch of uh, inequalities here. Do you uh, can you tell me intuitively? What do you think the relationship between these two will be? WS and RB. WS larger or smaller than RB? Smaller. <laughs> now here's a tricky one. Can you think of what the relationship between, sorry, EEV and WS or RP would be? Ah, excuse me, mistake. Sorry, sorry. EV, not E. So the objective function value of the deterministic equivalent. At first, it doesn't seem like it has any specific relationship to the other two. Turns out that for a specific type of uncertainty, when the right-hand side is the only source of uncertainty, it's a lower bound. So not a, we'll see why. But the takeaway is that you're solving this, you're getting some strategy, some X. And you're also getting a very optimistic estimate of your costs if you just solve this. We'll see why this is the case. So it's not, it's kind of misleading. Uh, you say, okay, I'll solve the deterministic equivalent program, see what happens. You get a decision and then you also look at the objective function value of your problem and you say, ah, yeah, and the costs are looking good. Especially if I compare them with the, with, the, with the perfect foresight costs, what I would do on average if I knew what's gonna happen, it's gonna be a lower number. So it's a very optimistic view of what uh, will actually happen. Of course, the expected performance of the solution is gonna be worse than the um, than this solution here because this is doing the best it can uh, for the true environment, which is an environment where we're taking expectations. We'll see how uh, these inequalities are unfold. Okay, so I, um, in this slide we show that wait and see is less than or equal to uh, recourse problem solution. You intuitively gave me the answer to that. If you know what's going to happen in advance, on average, you're going to do better. Uh, now we show that recourse problem solution is better than the average of <coughs> x bar of xi bar. So let me give up some notation here, just so you remember. This is what I do if I solve for the uh, average uncertainty. X of psi is what I do if I solve for outcome psi. And X star is the best I can do. And without knowing uncertainty. 
without knowing what which side is going to materialize. Okay? Is the distinction among these clear? If I know what's going to happen, the best thing to do the first stage is X xi. If I don't know what's going to happen, it's X star when I'm minimizing average cost. And if I set uncertainty equal to its average value, the best response is X bar of xi bar. Okay. Yes. So, in the second case, we know. Sorry. Yeah, this is just a, a notation that says if you know xi, x of xi is the best first stage decision if you knew that xi. So, we got perfect information. If that you, perfect information that xi specifically okay. will occur. And this x can be different for different xi. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so what can you say about the, uh, remember, it's a two-stage decision problem where the first stage looks like this. <coughs> what can you say about this solution when you plug it into the real two-stage optimization? So the real, by real two stage optimization, I'm referring to minimize first stage cost. Um, what can you say? about this problem, uh, about this solution, as far as these constraints are concerned. Which one of these does it automatically satisfy? First one, second. This changes with X size, so we can't say much about this one. And also non-negativity. So, uh, the important thing is that if I plug the solution into the full recourse problem, I will be doing necessarily worse than the X star. Because the X star is exactly solving this problem. Um, for example, the recourse pro this solution, although it might satisfy uh, AX equals B, for a certain Xi, it might be infeasible, and according to our convention earlier, uh, in that case, uh, th the objective function becomes infinity. And in general, it's not the best selection for this problem. The best selection for this problem is X star. So necessarily when we're uh, evaluating the average performance of uh, X bar, uh, X bar of Xi bar, it's going to be doing worse than what the recourse problem is doing. Is this clear? Again, you look concerned? No? Clear, clear, not concerned. Perfect. Uh, yes? X star is the best solution for average side. It's the best for average cost. So it's the optimal solution of this entire problem. Okay, and when we replace xi by the average, what was it? Uh, the notation here is not that we're averaging the xi. It's that we are picking the x that solves for xi bar. So if I, in particular, what I, what I mean is that x bar of xi bar solves H is the only source of uncertainty. I take the average H and I solve this problem. This will give me X bar of Xi bar. Xi here is just H. So H bar or Xi bar is the same. Okay, but I'm not averaging X. 
and suggest the optimal solution for this problem. I can plug this into here. It'll be an option, but it will not be, be the optimal option for this problem. So, I'm, um, so that's where this inequality comes from. Okay, um, now. Ah, uh, yes, before moving on, uh, here we, we, and this will be useful for the proofs that follow, uh, we will establish, and now we're focusing uncertainty on only the right hand side, we're assuming that only H is uncertain. We will show that Z, um, yeah, well, Z of X comma H, which is defined as this function here is jointly convex in x comma h. <clears throat> um, so here the delta is, indi is the indicator variable for this set of constraints that we saw in the previous uh, slide deck and q of x comma h is the second stage cost for outcome h. Jointly convex means that uh, we're trying to establish convexity over the full vector a x comma h. Okay, um, so how do we establish convexity in general? We take two points, like I drew earlier, and we try to show that the weighted average is higher than the actual evaluation of the function on uh, the average of these two points. So what we need to do is basically um, Here, the x is not x anymore. We're establishing joint convex in x comma h, so we're looking at x1, h1, and x2, h2. <clears throat> and we might as well assume immediately that these uh, candidates immediately satisfy the equality constraints. If they don't, both sides here, uh, both sides of the convex inequality that I want to show are immediately infinity, so there's not much. Proof. So without loss of generality, let's assume we're picking two candidates, x1 and x2, that satisfy the equality constraint. Um, so we have this notation here that says that... Um, right, so by definition of what z of x comma h is for uh, candidate x1 and right-hand side uncertainty h1, y1 is what's minimizing the second stage problem for H1, and Y2 is what's minimizing the second stage problem for H2 minus uh, TX2. So the important thing to notice is, uh, well, in the following bullet from this, uh, so here the Z of uh, lambda X1 plus one minus lambda X2 comes from the following. When I use this argument for the x variables, it basically changes this part as well as the, the q. Um, so this part becomes just this here when the x is this input. And then we have this uncertainty in the right hand side. So y lambda here is the vector that solves this second stage optimization problem. It's the second stage optimization problem where we've taken the weighted uh, average of the uncertainty and the weighted average of the first stage decisions. This is just notation. Um, now, the important thing to note is the following. If I take the optimal solution to Xi1, which is uh, the optimal reaction to Xi1 and X1, which is Y1, and the optimal reaction to uh, Xi2 and X2, which is Y2, and I take their weighted average, they will be um, a feasible solution for this linear program here. So uh, here's the weighted average of the first stage decisions. Here's the weighted average of the uncertainty. This weighted average is feasible for this linear program here. But it's not y lambda. Y lambda is the best uh, possible reaction for this first stage decision and for this uncertainty. So the weighted average of the uh, 
the weighted average over here is an upper bound to um, the second stage cost with the best reaction Y lambda. And that basically gives us um, the, the inequality we want. So um, we get that Z of the weighted average of first stage decisions and weighted average of uh, uncertainty is uh, less than or equal to uh, lambda Z for X1, H1, and 1 minus lambda Z for X2, H2. So this is important now because we know that the uh, Z function is jointly convex in the dimensions of the first stage decisions and the uncertainty. The really important part in this proof is to understand this step over here. If you just plug in the numbers, you know immediately the set of equality constraints that Y1 and Y2 satisfy, and this, you can immediately see why this is, uh, holds us in equality with this input, lambda, one, lambda Y1 plus 1 minus lambda Y2. Okay, so now, yes? Sorry, come again? Uh, so the last one is the first point. Here. Yes. Um, on the left, it is a scalar. On the right, it is a vector. Oh, my, sorry. Um, that should be Q transpose. Y1, Q transpose Y2. I will have to correct that. Thanks. But is it clear if it's Q transpose? Is it clear why it's the case? Okay. Where Yes, so what it should have been writing is Q transpose Y lambda plus lambda Q transpose Y1 plus 1 minus lambda Q transpose Y2 uh, less than or equal. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Is it clear why this holds? Yes. Okay. Okay, so. Um, now we have joint convexity in the first stage decision and the uncertainty. That's a very important structural uh, property. The, here's the reason. So um, we will th use this generic notation of f of psi being the best we can uh, for that outcome, psi. And we will now show that this function uh, well, we will now exploit the, the convexity of this, of this uh, function to also show that this function is convex just in the uncertainty. So if we know that it's convex in two dimensions and we're minimizing over one of them, we know that the remaining function is convex in the other dimension. And here's the way to do that. So um, <clears throat> by definition, f of psi 1 is um, the best I can do for input x1 and uncertainty xi1. 1 minus lambda f of x is the best I can do for uh, seconds uh, for, in, for uncertainty xi2 by deciding x2. And this inequality follows from the fact, uh, can, can you see why this first inequality holds? Over here, why this is greater than or equal to this? Right, it's jointly convex in both x and psi. Then, this inequality just follows from the fact that we're doing our best with respect to x on the right hand side. And the last inequality follows just by the definition of f. Bottom line, geometric bottom line, is we have a function that's convex in two things. We're doing the best we can with respect to one of the things. The residual is a convex function of the other thing. Now, we use this. Uh, so then we, we uh, use Jensen's inequality on this function f of psi. Jensen's inequality is another way of uh, stating convexity. It's just saying that uh, f of the average argument, so for a convex function, f of the average argument, let's call it x lambda, is less than 
are equal to the average of the argument, which is this thing here. It's just kind of like equivalent. Jensen's inequality is equivalent to convexity. So that shows that the weighted C is uh, more expensive than the uh, EV. That's what I was telling you earlier that solving a deterministic equivalent program is very, it gives you a very optimistic impression of your costs. Um, F of expectation of psi is exactly EV. It's do your, the best you can with respect to the average psi. Um, expectation of F of psi is exactly the wait and see. Average the best you can knowing what's going to happen. So the joint convexity in X and H results in a consequence to the conclusion uh, that when we're solving the deterministic equivalent problem, we have an optimistic estimate of our cost. It's biased downwards. Now, if that, we just proved this, if uh, the right-hand side, uh, okay, we, we just proved this, if only the right-hand side is uncertain. So we just assumed uncertainty in the H. There are situations in two-stage stochastic linear programs where you have other sources of uncertainty, and we'll see an example of now of uncertainty in the cube, where this inequality is violated. There, the, the EV is not biased downward. It gives you a value that's higher than the wait and see. So here's the example in the book. Just make sure. Okay. Um, so here's an example in the book. Where is the uncertainty here? <coughs> Does it fall into what we saw earlier? Right. The coefficient of y is uncertain. So this violates the assumption we made earlier. It's not the right hand side that's uncertain. Um, can you can you visualize what's the best thing to do here? We have a first stage cost coefficient of two, and in the second stage we have a xi times y. Suppose that xi is uh, one. <clears throat> what's the best thing to do? The way to think of this is we're trying to push everything down. Um, well, increasing x doesn't help me with the first term here. It's making me pay 2 for every unit of increase in x. But it's giving me space to push y down. So the optimal x really depends on what multiplies y. Pushing y down, there's a limit to it because it's a non-negative variable. So I can push x high and push y down but I, at some point y will hit zero. So um, the optimal reaction is to set uh, y equal to one minus x, provided it's uh, greater than or equal to zero, otherwise y goes to zero. And the trade-off is what I mentioned earlier. You're going up by two and the, you're going down at a rate that depends on the coefficient of y. <coughs> Now, for the deterministic equivalent problem, we're assuming that the chance of psi being one or three is three quarters and a quarter, respectively. The average of this is three over two. Three over two is less benefit than, uh, so three over two here is less benefit than two. So in this case, I want to push this as low as possible. I push it to zero. Um, and that's the x bar of xi bar, and the y becomes 1. So the EV of this is 3 over 2. If we solve the wait and see, when xi is small, then the best thing to do is push x low, keep it low, and uh, just take the um, uh, yeah, push x as low as possible, and then y will pick up the rest. But when xi is high, the best thing to do is uh, increase x and push y down. So when you do the math, you get a wait and see average value of 5 over 4. It turns out that this is actually smaller 
than the EV. So this is an example where a source of uncertainty in the objective function actually results in uh, an overestimation from the deterministic equivalent problem. Okay. Um, this is an example, well, this is an inequality that's in the book. I don't know if it's really much worth it's just another illustration of the sub well, of of um, the yeah the convex. I mean, again, for this proof, we're exploiting the joint convexity in X and Xi, but the inequality is kind of obscure, so I won't focus too much on it. So we can move uh, with the rest of the material in the chapter, but it's just another. Uh, inequality that uh, exploits the, the convexity of joint convexity of Z on X and the uncertainty. <coughs> uh, yes, this one is interesting. This one is interesting. Um, right. This inequality um, considers a slightly different version of the two-stage problem. Can you, can you see a difference between this version of the two-stage problem and the standard version you've seen so far? Are they equivalent? Is one special case of another? This versus... Uh, right, so... By z of x xi, I hope it's clear that I mean, and I will write it explicitly over here. z of x xi means um, doing the best we can, assuming we know the outcome of answering. So we're not taking into equations here. We know what's going to happen. Do you think this is uh, equivalent to this case? First of all, in terms of like uh, notation, do you know the difference? Right. In the second stage, inequality. So do you think it's the same as this? Can any problem in this form be cast as that? Generally not. It's a specific. We can cast any of these problems like this, but not the other way around. <clears throat> Here, the, pro the problem structure is specific. The second stage decisions are meeting some lower limits. Um, and that's why we're using the, the subscript. Yeah. So um, what we want to show now is that ah okay. So the specific structure means that uh, here this is kind of like what Adrian mentioned in, in the beginning of the class. This falls into the category of those problems where we can I easily identify a worst case scenario. Is the scenario with the highest right hand side? If uncertainty is only on the right hand side here and it becomes highest for a certain xi. That's an obvious choice for a worst case scenario. It creates the most difficulty for me in the second stage. So that's a special scenario for these kinds of problems. Uh, we call that right hand side H max, and we call the optimal reaction to that worst case scenario X max. And we have this result that says that the recourse problem is upper bounded by um, the worst case scenario for um, H max. This should hopefully be obvious uh, from the... F is it obvious to you why this is the case? Okay, so here are the arguments. Um, so we, we, the, the point of the fourth section is to... It's more of like a setup example to show you that 
these two things can be uh, non-negative, but the, uh, there's an example where we see one of them is zero, so EVPI is zero and VSS is positive, and sometimes EVPI is zero, and uh, that's what I just said. EVPI can sometimes be zero, and VSS can be positive, and the other way around. So the ranking here, the, the example you will see is kind of like an, an, uh, a little exercise in um, like eyeballing solutions, but the ranking here is important to remember. Again, uh, and again, this graph refers to situations with only right-hand side uncertainty in the age. EV is the deterministic equivalent problem objective function value. It's an underestimator of cost. Next comes wait and see, where you have an oracle that tells you what's going to happen. Next, you have the objective function value of the full stochastic program. And the last is the uh, expectation of the simple solution. OK, so we know these two are non-negative. Uh, again, EVPI is how much we would be willing to pay a profit that walks up to us and tells us uh, what's going to happen. VSS is how much better we're doing compared to the down solution. Um, the question is how do these two um, uh, relate to each other and when can one be zero, the other can be positive. Um, so here's the example that's in the book. When you first look at the example, you're thinking, oh my god, what is this load of equations? It looks really ugly. So after staring at it for a little while, um, I can give you the, the shortcuts to deciphering the, the equations. We have a two-stage optimization problem. First stage question. Two first stage decisions, two second stage decisions. First stage decisions are x1 and x2. Second stage decisions are y1 and y. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, my mistake. There is really one second stage decision. It's really only y1. And the y2s are there just as emergency um, backup. So you want y1 to equal xi plus uh, x1 minus 2x2. And if it cannot be equal to this thing, then you activate your auxiliary variables. Whenever you activate them, you hurt a lot. You hurt by 10. Uh, and these auxiliary variables can increase the left-hand side or decrease it. The constraint is that x1 and x2, x1 plus x2 have to sum up to 1, and the x's and y's are not negative. So yeah, you do have three second stage decisions, but to simplify it in your head, you can think that you, really your second stage decision is just y1, and the other two things, uh, the, the, the other two uh, variables here are auxiliary. And the idea is to keep them as small as possible. So what is the optimal reaction in the second stage for this problem, given a first stage decision, given the realization of uncertainty? Well. If the, ah, and another important thing to note is that y1 is between 0 and 2. So this left hand side can only move between in this band. Well, if the right hand side is something between 0 and 2, I'm going to set y1 equal to the right hand side and avoid activating the auxiliary variables. So the optimal reaction uh, for this right hand side zero and two is just y1 takes all of the all of the right all of the right hand side here. Now if the right hand side goes above two, I'm gonna push y1 as high as I can and then pick up the rest with y2 plus. And so y1 becomes two, y2 plus becomes the rest. Clear? So far? Have I have you lost me? So ah okay. Okay, so again, um, think of this xi plus x1 minus 2x2 as a right hand side. y1 can be move between 0 and 2. Um, so any 
if, if this right hand side is out of, is below zero or above two, you need to make up with it with the auxiliary variables. You don't want to use them because they cost 10 each. So you want to avoid using them as much as possible. So if this thing here is 2.2, for example, what would you do? If the right hand side here is equal to 2.2. 2. Uh, it's not Leopold, is not Leopold and Ke no, Michel, oh my god, <laughs> Kentan. It's not Michel. Gautier, yes, I knew that, but then I forgot. Okay. <laughs> What would you do, Gautier? Yeah. What do you think is the best thing to do? If the right hand side is 2.2. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is it? Why, uh, why 1 is 2 and then uh, why 2 plus is uh, 1. And then if it's minus 0 0.2, uh, the other so way around. Two and, uh, why 2 minus is Exactly. That's what's going on here. That's all we're doing. Well, then the Z, you can write it out. Once you plug in these closed form expressions into the objective function value, you can write out the Z as a closed form function of the uncertainty and the excess. And now we start playing around with this thing and show that there are situations where EVPI can be zero and VSS can be non-zero. So we have this uh, closed form expression for Z. Um, we, okay. What if, if uh, the right hand side is between zero and two, we have Y1 picking, all of, uh, picking up all of the right hand side. So if, if uh, the right-hand side is between 0 and 2, we have z being equal to <clears throat> x1 plus 4x2 uh, plus the right-hand side, which is xi plus x1 minus 2x2 because y1 will pick it all up. So what happens here is uh, 4 minus 2 becomes 2, x1 plus x1 becomes 2, so we are left with this whenever we are in this region here. Yes. Yes, correct. I will change that also. Um, so it's 2 plus xi. Um, then in the other regions, since we're forced to activate uh, these auxiliary variables, we know that the right hand side will be something at least as much as this. So you can go through it in detail with inequalities if you want, but the intuition is as simple as that. In the other two regions, since we are forced to activate the really expensive variables, this, uh, these segments of the objective function are lower bounded by 2 plus xi. So that gives us the following information. Um, Whenever we pick the x's so that we land between 0 and 2, we know we've made an optimal choice of x's. The z cannot become lower than uh, 2 plus xi. Uh, so when does that happen? So what we do know from the statement is that xi is uniformly distributed between 1 and 3. Um, So, whenever we pick the x's that lie in this polyhedron and satisfy these uh, conditions that we are in this optimal, so we're in this region whenever these inequalities here hold, 
then we know that we've made an optimal choice of x's. So we're kind of like approaching the problem in the opposite direction. We're looking at what, uh, where the psi needs to land so that we've made the optimal choice of x's. Uh, so if, if you play around with these inequalities, you can see that, for example, if you, if you plug in one-third and two-thirds, these inequalities become uh, 2 minus 1 less than or equal to psi less than or equal to 4 minus 3 times 2 thirds, which uh, is equivalent to 2, uh, sorry, 1 psi. I did wrong here. Ah, x1. Okay, so this is x1. So, if we pick this candidate for a stage solution, x equal to a third, we make sure that the left-hand side here is 1, the right-hand side is 3. We know psi is uniformly distributed between 1 and 3. So if we pick this first stage solution, we know whatever happens, we've made an optimal choice. Why? Because we're lying in the first region here, which is the bottom of this uh, objective function. So we have a situation where uh, we found a first stage solution that no matter what happens in the second stage is optimal. This is kind of a degenerate case of a stochastic program. Um, it's a very specific um, setup which occurs rarely. Rarely in decision problems under uncertainty can you find something that in the first stage that no matter what happens with the uncertainty is uh, the best you could have done. So um, what happens when the optimal first stage decision is independent of Xi? Is it any benefit to me to have an oracle that tells me what will happen? It's, it's, uh, since I found an X that's optimal for all Xi, doesn't matter if the oracle is there or not. But in this specific example, you can have a, you have a, Broad range, so if you take the average Xi, you have a single linear program with a range of first stage optimal solutions. And it can turn out that you pick one of these first stage solutions that's not the best one to pick. In this specific example, 0, 1 is a, an optimal first stage response for uh, the average uncertainty, which is 2. So if you look at these inequalities, indeed X. Um, Picking x to be 0, 1 is the, an, an optimal reaction for the average outcome, which is 2. It's not the only uh, best choice you can make, but it is 1, but it's not the best for all xi. It's only best for the average xi. So in this situation, what we end up having is the value of the oracle, which is UPI, is 0, but the value of the stochastic solution is positive, because out of all the, x, the x's we could have picked, we picked 1 that did not, uh, did not turn out to be optimal for every Xi. It was just optimal for the average Xi. Okay. And then it's like change. So this example shows a situation where if UPI is zero and VSS is positive, we then have a situation where VSS is zero and the EVPI is positive. When does this occur? So we slightly change the description of a Uncertainty. Now, instead of uniform between 1 and 3, we have a discrete distribution over three possible outcomes. Uh, and what we get here is three regions of optimality for the first stage decisions, which are... Uh, so when, when, um, when zero materializes, the first scenario, this is the region of optimal first stage decisions. When three, sec uh, 3 over 2 ma materializes, this is the region, and when uh, outcome 3 materializes, this is the region. You, if you look at these inequalities here, you will note that they have no common intersection. Which means what? There is no single first stage decision that is the best for all three possible scenarios. Leopold, do you look concerned? You agree? You agree. Okay. Uh, when situations like this occur, when the intersection for all scenarios of the first stage optimal decisions has, is empty, then you expect benefits 
from solving a stochastic um, um, bum, bum, bum. you expect benefits sorry from 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 having an oracle tell you what's going to happen because what's going to uh, happen will really change in a, in, a, in a concrete way how you would have decided in the first stage. So there, the EVPI becomes positive. Uh, and it turns out that in this situation, if you take the average outcome, which is obviously 3 over 2, uh, then you can pick a first stage solution which is identical to the solution of the full stochastic program. So, out of all this busy example, what have we seen? We can have a situation where the x is independent of the uncertainty, and there, there is no value of having an oracle, so EVPI is zero. Uh, and in this specific example, we also saw that the x bar of xi bar lied in a region where we may happen to make the, right, the wrong choice. Uh, so out of the multiple options for x bar of xi bar, we chose one that was not the best for all scenarios. So that created a value of stochastic solution which is positive. And we saw a slight variation of this example where the intersection of the optimal x's for all xi was empty. And that created a value of having an oracle. So EVPI became positive. But we were able to solve the deterministic equivalent problem. And it gave us the exact same answer as solving the stochastic program. So VSS became zero. Okay, that was the takeaway uh, from the specific paragraph. Now, uh, paragraph 4 5 shows you in a very simple way, and I will probably not uh, dwell in it uh, in detail, but the message is that um, where intuitively, what would you think? creates fertile ground for solving a stochastic program. Um, so what situations do you expect make it worth the effort? This is kind of an abstract question. Um, can you think of one metric, um, one statistical metric of the uncertainty that intuitively, if it increases, the value of the stochastic program uh, increases. Variance? Yes. So if variance is higher, intuitively you expect that it's probably worth being more smart about uh, optimizing against expected cost. And I can confirm this from work that I've done, for example, in the power system study we did in California where we studied what happens when you throw a lot of wind energy into the California electric power system. Indeed, when you go for the 2030 targets of the state for renewable integration, which are, are twice as high as the 2012 targets, the benefits of doing a, a stochastic programming optimization were about two to three times higher in terms of making day ahead decisions more intelligent. So the EVPI that we computed was two to three times higher as the variance of the wind supply increased. Why? Because the 2030 targets were more aggressive. Um, what the paragraph shows you here is that although that is intuitively uh, reasonable to assume, in fact, it doesn't have to be that way. So um, we have an example given in the book where uh, we have this simple linear program, and the way I, I visualize this specific example is quite simple. So, we have a... Because <coughs> I could be a third or two-thirds with equal likelihood. And the way I draw this is this is steep increase of six for every 
unit you move to the right. And then I have third and two thirds. You have a decrease. So this is the first stage cost term. And these two here are the second stage cost terms. Um, so what I'm um, blah, blah, blah. okay. So yeah. So depending on where the xi lands, if it's a third or two thirds, you get a different optimal choice. And the way you decode the optimal reaction is by looking at this graph. At least I did that. I, I did that by looking at this graph here. And let me try and give you an example of how to do this graph. Um, so let's see what we have uh, for Xi1, the optimal reaction to Xi1. And when Xi1 is a third, by moving to the right from minus infinity, every step I make is bringing me down minus uh, uh, Every step I'm moving to the right is bringing me down by minus 6 because I'm uh, decreasing each of these by, um, by. Uh, these are steeper. They are 10. Okay. So these are, in fact, steeper. And now I messed up the drawing. You explore something like this. So every step I make in the um, uh, positive direction is bringing me down by uh, minus uh, minus ten, and then uh, by minus four. Sorry, because I'm decreasing by minus ten here, and I'm increasing by. Uh, six here, so I'm, I'm, I'm decreasing by minus four. But the uh, moment I hit a third, I start picking up cost, right, in the second stage. So then I get the um, contribution of six plus ten. So the optimal point to stop moving from the left is a third. It's, um, I made this much more complicated than I should have. In any case, that's kind of a geometric way to come up with these uh, solutions. And it turns out that if you take this as a reference case where the variance is 1 over 36, you then change the model of the uncertainty of it. So in the xi line between 0 and 1, the variance increases. And here you get the expected result that the EVPI jumps from 2 to uh, from 2 thirds to 2, so it triples, and the VSS also triples. Kind of like what you expect to see uh, intuitively. But then uh, you can change the model of uncertainty slightly, so you put a mass, uh, mass at 0.2 for xi equals 0 and uh, uh, 0.8 for 5 eighths. Variance increases uh, slightly, it goes from 136 to 116. But the VSS uh, decreases, in particular, it goes to 0, and EVPI. Uh, increases. So here we have kind of a counterintuitive thing where we're pushing variance up, VSS goes down, and EVPI increases. And then we also have a situation where by pushing variance up, we can have the other thing happen. The VSS can increase, and the EVPI uh, can go down. So although intuitively you would think that more uncertainty means these two things go up, it doesn't have to necessarily be the case in general. Now, um, the last part of this section, I think, is also the most interesting one, is uh, coming up with bounds on uh, these two metrics without having to solve an enormous stochastic program. And again, I, I think it's very useful for this section to wear your programmer's hat and think, OK, how can I, before bothering even solving this problem, how can I come up with a computationally fast way to see if it's worth solving the problem. Um, and we, we've already shown a couple of things. So when we were back here, 
Um, what would have happened? Let, uh, we we show we discussed that this is really simple to solve. EV is just a linear program. EV is just um, summation of different. Uh, well, it's it's a, actually how do you compute this? This is an interesting question. How do you compute this? Do you solve an optimization problem here for A and B? Come again? WS. EV, I will write it out for you, is Think of how this translates into ample, for example. What are you doing here? Of? But how did you get this? Uh, oh, Sorry. Um, <coughs> right. Um, but. No, 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 no. Uh, this is incorrect. Excuse me. Um, I'm defining z of x. Sorry, let's go back to the definition here. Excuse me. This is. Let's go to the definition of double EV. Point in rewriting it is this thing here. So, what, did the, what does it take to compute EV? So, minimize Z where Z is equal to this. So, every uh, Z for a given side K that I want to compute here is a, is a linear program. Okay. Um, I, Exactly. This is the source of the extra computation. So EV is not just summing up a bunch of stuff. It's also solving a large number of scenarios. There are small problems, especially because the X vector has been fixed now to this uh, first stage value. But it is solving a bunch of linear programs. So um, that said, um, Suppose I go through the whole process of computing this. Turns out that it's equal to this. This, we all agree, is just solving the single linear program. This is solving a bunch of linear programs, the number of which is equal to the number of my scenarios. If they're equal, that's a lot of info. Did we even need to solve a stochastic program? We have a, a guarantee that all of these guys are equal to each other. So, in fact, the x-bar of xi-bar is an optimal decision. Well, more often than not, it's not going to be um, that easy to get away with it. So we want to come up with methods to bound uh, the WS and the RP that prevent us from having to solve the full um, stochastic program. And to do this, we, we, are, uh, we, we come up with uh, the notion of a reference scenario. This is, we choose what a reference scenario is. Um, and th there are various uh, rules for coming up with it. For example, the average scenario can be an obvious choice of an, a reference scenario or in situations where we have these uh, 
greater than or equal constraints in the second stage, we can pick the reference scenario to be the worst case scenario. That's also a very special scenario to select that will give us information by solving it. By the way, uh, it, if we take the average, for example, of all scenarios, it's not necessarily the case that it has to be a member of the scenario set. Hopefully that's obvious. Even also if we take a component-wise worst-case scenario, that also does not have to be in the scenario set. Um, now, if the scenario is in the scenario set, we assign to it a probability PR, which is equal to the uh, chance of that scenario occurring. But even if it's not in the scenario set, this uh, equality generalizes, so PR is equal to zero. So that's uh, the uh, reference scenario. What do we use it for now? We use it for solving a bunch of pairs subproblems. We will solve these in order to get bounds. These problems are easy to solve. Why are they easy to solve? Relatively easy. How many scenarios do they have? It's basically an artificial problem I've made up with two scenarios. The reference scenario with the probability of PR and the, its pair, which is one of the capital K scenarios, with a probability where I'm putting a weight of pro, uh, 1 minus PR for the other one. So I've created this pair problem. It's an artificial problem. Uh, it's just a stochastic program with two scenarios. Two is much better than, for example, a thousand. It's still a manageable problem. And uh, we can solve it fast, and it gives us information. We'll see what kind of information it gives us. So a bit of notation here. <coughs> so we, we formulate a pair subproblem by pairing up a reference scenario with a certain scenario, xi k. This problem will have a solution in the first stage decision space. We will denote that as bar x with a superscript of k, where k implicates the k pair subproblem, and we, it has a component for the pair's second stage uh, constraint of y bar superscript k, and the other scenario second stage constraints, uh, second stage decision for that are denoted as y of psi k. And the objective function value of this thing is denoted as the ZP, where P stands for pairs, uh, with this argument as input. Can you see why it's the case that this problem here is just a deterministic optimization against the reference scenario? What happens if I pair up the reference scenario with itself? How does this objective function look like? Just second stage cost for what second stage constraints? These are identical now. It's just the second stage constraints for the reference now. Okay. Um, so we have this, uh, and how many of these do we get? Okay. Unless the reference scenario is in the scenario set, in which case it's, uh, well, actually it's still K, where one of them is just the reference scenario with itself. Um, and then we take ki kind of like an average of these things, but um, scaled. I don't want to say conditioned. Scaled. So the scaling factor is 1 over 1 minus the mass of the uh, reference scenario, and then we're averaging the ZPs for all scenarios except the reference one if the reference scenario is in the scenario set. Are we following up to now? Now, this is kind of easy to compute, right? We solve K optimization problems and we're kind of averaging them. It's not exactly an average, but we're kind of averaging it. And again, a pair sub problem is much easier than the full stage stochastic program because the constraint matrix, as opposed to the monster I drew earlier, is going to have two blocks one for the reference. Um, scenario and one block for its pair. And this is manageable if each of these is manageable. Okay, 
that said, this SP we will turn out to be very useful. It will give us a bunch of uh, bounds. So, um, first obvious bound, well, it's not a bound, it's an inequality. If the reference scenario is not a scenario set, SPV is the uh, wait and see value. Can you see why that's the case? What is the factor here? Um, when we're summing up and we are not picking up the reference scenario, are we missing any of the scenarios? We're not. And what are these ZPs? Uh, that's the tricky part. Can we input, sorry, maybe the chair coincides with z of x psi k. Um, so when pr is zero, zp coincides with z of psi k, z of x psi k. Um, why? We are zero. We're left with this, right? Right. right. Uh, yes. Yes. No. Um, so when P R is zero, this term goes away. We're le just left with C transpose X plus Q transpose Y of Xi K. And the question is if we have any extra constraints. So we have the normal constraints of the wait and see problem. But we also have these. Right, I mean, okay, the assumption here is that um, I guess there's a little assumption missing here that whatever choice of x we make, we don't make these constraints infeasible, which is called complete recourse, that no matter what the first stage decision and the uncertainty, we can always find a second stage decision that is feasible, no matter how expensive it is. So there's an assumption I think here that's missing a complete recourse that no matter what the x and the xi, we always have a feasible second stage reaction. Well, if PR is going to be zero, the second stage reaction is not going to matter, then we don't care what the reaction is. And solving this is just solving the, per, the oracle problem for that scenario. Have I completely lost you or sort of completely lost you? Okay. Um, so ZP of, uh, we're, we're, uh, I'm trying to convince you that ZP of X, Xi, R, Xi, K is the oracle solution for scenario Xi, K. If uh, the reference scenario is not in the scenario set, that's what I'm trying to convince you. So let's look at what happens in the objective function. When PR is zero, this term goes away, and we're left with this guy. The oracle problem looks like this. The only difference being that in this pairs problem, we have these bunch of uh, constraints over here. It's a bunch of linear constraints, but um, if we have complete recourse in the problem, it means that, that no matter what x I pick, and no matter what the xi are, I can always come up with a second stage reaction that satisfies these equality constraints. That's the definition of having complete recourse in a problem. It's a definition we, we will see, but the bottom line is that uh, these y of xi r's are just dead weight. They really don't matter for the optimization because the objective function, since pr is zero, only depends on this component here. So solving this pairs uh, problem is like solving the oracle problem for scenario k. The only thing that changed is this bunch of extra linear equalities. Convinced? Sorry. Leopold looks concerned. Not convinced. For, uh, for, for complete recourse, again. Uh, complete recourse says that no matter the x I pick and the scenario that materializes, there is always a y that satisfies 
wy equals that. Now, that's not a property of all stochastic linear programs, but when a linear pro stochastic linear program has that property, it's called complete recourse. Okay. Um, so I guess that this equality holds under that condition. I might be way wrong here, and it might hold generally, but I don't see it if it holds generally, just because we have all these equal extra equality constraints here. Okay, so equality holds given complete recourse, that's for sure, maybe it holds in general. Now, and what happens now if, uh, and here's where uh, SPV becomes practically important, is what happens, and I have five minutes left, unfortunately, what happens when um, XIR is in the scenario set? Well, one thing you can say is that the weight and C solution is upper bounded by the SPV. Uh, and you can also say that the uh, SPV lower bounds the um, recourse problem solution. Uh, it's, um, I don't have time now to go through the proof. Um, we can go through it in the next lecture, but this is the takeaway that we have these bounds here occurring. The proof is fairly simple, although it looks really hairy. It's just a bunch of uh, algebraic manipulations. It's not that bad, really. Uh, so we have now an upper bound. Uh, we have a, an easy way to come up with a number called SPV. And it's an upper bound for uh, uh, wait and see. That's, that's useful. Now we have information about is it worth um, solving the stochastic program. And we actually also have an upper bound on RP that uh, we can get in an easy way. Uh, this upper bound on RP is called EVRS. So this is a fiesta of uh, initial. That hopefully, I mean, it's not that bad. I, when I first saw it, it was really annoying. But after reading the chapter a couple of times, it was really uh, easy to remember. So EVRS, all it's doing is it's picking the best scenario out of the uh, uh, pairs problems. So you can show that this number, uh, oh sorry, EVRS is the average performance of the uh, optimal solution to the reference scenario. That's one thing. So I saw the, um, deterministic equivalent problem, but instead of solving for the average xi, I solve for the reference xi. That gives me x bar r, and EVRS is the average performance of that. EPV is this uh, minimum here. Again, very easy to compute. So both of these numbers, important thing to remember is they are very easy to compute, and there are bounds that are kind of straightforward to establish, and I should have had a graph where... Ah, yes, okay, the, the, the important thing is that both of these bound their recourse problem solution. Main takeaway, and I can uh, cover, well, uh, let's, let's cover the example at least, and then we can go through the proofs in the, in the beginning of the next uh, lecture. But the example is quite illustrative of why these things are useful. So, the example has four scenarios. Uh, we are minimizing, it's kind of like a capacity planning problem. We plan capacity called X, and uh, in the second stage, we decide on Y, which is like production, and we have capacity constraints that say that factory one, for example, uses uh, this production factors by 1 and y2 to this extent, and uh, the capacity of factory 2 bounds uh, production through this inequality, and the production has to be between point eight of demand or full demand, and the same for y2. It's kind of like a capacity expansion planning problem. And we have three scenarios, uh, sorry, two scenarios. It's a two-dimensional vector of uncertainty. So, uh, demand one can be for 
R6 with equal likelihood, and demand 2 can be 4 or 8 with equal likelihood. And these two are independent of each other. Now, uh, we're going to create bounds using all of these ideas. So, what does the wait and see and the EV give us? How do we compute the wait and see? We take each of these scenarios independently, we solve it. That gives us first stage decisions, second stage decisions, and an objective function value. Four optimization problems because we have four scenarios. Can you see where the four scenarios are coming from? It's two-dimensional uh, uncertainty vector, so the combination. So we take the weighted average of these. The weighted C value is 9.2. OK. Uh, then we take the average of the uncertainty, 5.6. We solve for that. That gives us the dumb first stage thing to do, which is 5, 4.8. It gives us an optimistic estimate of our costs, which turns out to be 9.2. And in fact, if we plug this candidate, uh, sorry, if we plug this candidate first stage solution into the full stochastic program, there will be scenarios for which demand will not be satisfied. That means that the EEV, the expected performance of this thing, is infinity because there is a scenario where it didn't satisfy demand. Okay, um, so let's see what uh, what if any information we get about the value of uh, perfect information, the, the VSS, and so on, and so on. So we have that uh, EV is equal to weight and C, which is 9.2, and EV is infinity, so we know that weight and C and recourse, uh, EVPI and VSS are anything between zero and infinity. Okay, very um, informative. Uh, we knew that already. Uh, we have not put bounds to our problem that tell us if it's worth solving the stochastic program. So now we do the pairs problem reformulation. We pick a reference scenario. We pick the worst case one in this situation, uh, and we solve a bunch of pairs subproblems that look like this. They have two sets of constraints, and we get the following numbers: first scenario paired up with a reference scenario first stage uh, decisions, second stage decisions under the reference scenario, second stage decisions under the k pair, and the ZPs, which is the, you know, the juice out of the lemon that we want to keep. So then we calculate the SPV for all of these three guys. Um, easy to compute. We also compute the EPEV, which is just minimizing over three numbers. Again, ridiculously easy to compute. The EVRS is the expected performance of the reaction to the reference scenario, which is this one. Again, easy to compute. The bottom line is that um, now, we, with sol solving pairs subproblems, we get much more information. Uh, in particular, we know that EPEV upper bounds the recourse problem. And we observe that, in fact, it turns out to be equal to SPV, which lower bounds the recourse problem value. So we have a guarantee that the recourse problem value is exactly 30.94. Um, the example is kind of set up to work out that way, but, it's, but now we have information that whatever the uh, solution that we feed into EPV is actually this optimal solution and we didn't even have to solve the stochastic program. We just computed these bounds, we came up with uh, decisions as side effects and we showed that one of them is the optimal solution to the stochastic program just by working with bounds. At the beginning of the next lecture I'll uh, derive the inequalities that we use for bounding. Sorry for keeping you a few minutes over time.